Hello, bootstrappers. Hello, bootstrappers. Well, today we're going to start bringing you what we're going to call bootstrap playbooks, where we rip apart a good book that either one of us have read, looking for those strategies and innovations that you can apply to your startup journey. And we're starting with Mapping Innovation by Greg Sattel. Normally, as a bootstrapper, you wouldn't necessarily read this book because he wrote it for big companies who are trying to not get their butt kicked by you out there. We think it's part of our job to translate it from they don't get to have the only playbook. If we take it, pull the gems out and give them to you, then we help you kick a large company's ass. That's right. And that's who you are and what you're going to do. His big idea to save you uh, 200 pages of reading, although he wrote a very good book and I do recommend it, is the innovation matrix. And okay. on the vertical axis, you've got how well defined is the problem. And on the horizontal axis, you've got how available is this technology? And so Eva, how does he kind of break it down here? Well, so let's go ahead and just look at the quadrants and use them as examples. Basic research, the bottom left quadrant, you're basically, the, there's no real defined problem. You're in pure research mode. You're looking for new stuff, like, like brand new, the Eureka aha stuff. So this is where the invention of new tech is, is there because it didn't exist before. If you go all the way up to the upper right quadrant, you have a well-defined problem. People know what they're trying to solve and solutions for them. Absolutely. So let's go through these one at a time. So basic research is typically done by large companies, and actually not very many companies can do this. IBM's one that is big enough to do it. AT&T was for a long time or universities. Now, sometimes there's a lone inventor, like the Dyson guy who works out in his garage for five or 10 years to come up with a really cool vacuum, but it's rare and it takes a long time. Now, I know there's a fantasy of, there's a fantasy of like being the next Edison. Uh, it's rare. If that is you, blessings to you, but it's, it's kind of rare. Absolutely. And mostly it's not that you couldn't, it's just, it might take half your lifetime. Yeah, it's just the amount of resources that need to be thrown at the problem. Uh, doing basic research typically requires a lot of time, a lot of uh, a lot of resources. Edison is a good example where he well, went through over a thousand iterations trying to develop a light bulb. Which, and if you're if you're an Edison, this is your blessed quadrant for sure. Absolutely, but for most startups, you're not going to start here because the path to get to commercial application is really long. So large companies that do this, IBM is a great example. You're right. IBM and then a lot of government sponsored stuff. I mean, I've, I've met startups like I actually worked for one as an office manager that DARPA funded them to create little electrodes that would <laughs> go into a mouse's head to map out the uh, firing neurons. But that's pretty rare. And this guy was really talented. Do, do you remember? Yeah, it's him also that's creepy. <laughs> we'll also see a lot of basic research coming out of universities, you know, and so they'll have either partnerships with uh, large companies or they'll have partnerships with governments like DARPA, government um, institutions like DARPA. Now, the next area, which is more relevant for bootstrappers, he calls breakthrough innovation. And this is when you've got a patent or you've discovered a process to apply some technology and the main thing is your customers, they can't buy this anywhere else. You're the only person that can do this for them. Well, they can't buy it anywhere else. They've been wanting it. Like they're, look, they're looking for a place to buy it, but they just can't. And we had a startup that we invested in that you they invented a way to use magnetic waves to measure your heartbeat. And they had a patent on it. And no other company had that way of measuring heartbeats. And so for like uh, baby monitoring companies, this was a perfect thing that they'd been looking for, a way to monitor your baby's health without a wire attached to them because, you know, a baby will wrap it around their head and bad things happen. This is the one that is really the death trap for a startup. It's a sustaining innovation that creates a marginal improvement that you would think, oh man, they're going to want to buy it from me. 
but really they don't want to buy it from a new startup. They want to buy it from one of their existing uh, vendors. Incremental improvements are, are on technology or processes that a company relies on. And so for them to go and get that improvement from a startup is incredibly risky. They will keep it in-house if they possibly can. That's right. And startups who try to sell sustaining innovation almost always get crushed by the existing players because they already have the customer relationship. They're the known quantity. Uh, no one wants to buy it from you. And the existing companies are usually really good at delivering this. And so they'll just come along and add that innovation to their stack. So if you come up with something that's just a little better or a little different, they're not going to switch too hard. All right, so this is another quadrant that bootstrappers need to pay attention to because this is where you can get traction uh, as well because you're going up against existing players who can't change their business model to match what you're doing. You're not, you're not creating new technology like for dating. We, everyone, anyone could have built a website. It wasn't proprietary, but the existing players couldn't afford to charge the prices we did or have national distribution if it was in the local newspaper. And the product is probably inferior, like in-person uh, video dating might have been a better high-end product, but you couldn't uh, charge like we did. So it was inferior, but over time, it became good enough for everyone to start using it. And, and you guys had a similar experience, didn't you, Eva? We did. I just want to say one of the things I love about this quadrant, and I think that startups do well in this quadrant is because the existing uh, the existing competition is there. They've already pre-educated a lot of people about what's possible, but they've got themselves stuck in a glue trap where they can't move without cannibalizing their own business. So you have an educated uh, audience. And if you can shift out how you do it, Usually there's a new segment that opens up that they're just not satisfying well. So we did that. Uh, the technology was out there. We basically took it and converted it into a SaaS model, uh, software as a service. So it didn't. they didn't need to have somebody uh, on hand with all of the expertise. They could fire it up and, and get the coverage that they couldn't get before. So, you know, when we think about this, there's two quadrants that probably aren't you know, good targets for your normal bootstrapper. Uh, sustaining innovation, you're going to get clobbered by the uh, new guys. And basic research, I mean, it's okay if that's your passion, but you're looking at a long time to get something to market. So it almost has to be a hobby out in your garage that you're tinkering around with for this to work. Where should you be looking as a bootstrapper? You should be looking in the breakthrough innovation quadrant or the disruptive innovation quadrant if you're wanting to start something and get it out to the marketplace pretty fast. Now, if you're that lone inventor, maybe you're over in basic research, but just understand your path is going to take a lot longer. Yeah. So breakthrough innovation, there's no petition there and it's completely like open water for you. Disruptive innovation, what makes it such existing competition, has got themselves boxed in and there's gonna be a gap that you can shoot through that they can't find. So here's the traps I see people fall into is that they think they're disrupting somebody when they're only marginally improving the business. Like I, I remember someone pitching me, they're like, we can save 5% of their bandwidth cost. And for a really big company, that's a huge number, but you know, they're just gonna use someone else to do that that's, a, that's not a startup. So we fell into that trap a couple of times where we thought we were disruptive. We were for part of the customer market that we went after. And for others that we thought we were a good fit, it was going to be just sustaining and they just weren't interested. No, they wanted it from their existing vendor, didn't they? They did. Okay, so this next trap, um, you may have a great solution, but if the switching costs are higher than the pain that you're solving, they will not switch. Talk about the kind of decision-making those companies made when they were comparing you to big company A, they usually go with safety, don't they? For us, we, we actually ended up educating a lot of customers about you know, what, was, what was great about doing perpetual scanning and, and actually doing better security. They thought it was a great idea, but when we were first 
we're starting this, so this is great. Now we're going to go find somebody that I won't get fired for hiring. There was a joke. Nobody got fired for hiring the big five. Now, this was before Enron, but uh, <laughs> it typically went with a safe uh, choice. And so what you what you forget or what's easy to forget when you're doing a startup is how fragile you look. I always talk about it as big companies are like elephants and startups are like a mayfly. You're only going to live for a very small amount of time unless you grow big fast. And by the time the elephant gets around to talking to you about it, your life spans over. We had sold vulnerability management system into ACS, which was a really large outsourcing firm at the time, and then also into Pro Systems. And we had talked to EDS for 18 months and finally got, like, we're so close to a yes, it's awesome. And then they would have a, um, a reorg. We're like, crap, well, we're just gonna stay in here because we still know the people, but they shuffled around. And six months later, like we were really close again and they reorged, they reorged four times. Yeah. And, and that that happens a lot to startups. And if you put all your eggs in that basket, uh, you end up uh, running out of runway and dying. How does this inform how a bootstrapper should think about and the kind of problems they should tackle is you really need to think through what quadrant you're in. And for God's sakes, make sure you're not in the sustaining <laughs> innovation quadrant or you're in for a beating. And then. How do you ask questions that help clarify why people are going to choose you over what they're doing or what they're not doing and still making money not doing it? Yeah, so the different questions are like, am I giving customers a completely new ability or am I servicing customers and customers already exist, but they're not happy? So the cool thing when you think about it this way and you go, all right, am I a uh, breakthrough innovation, or am I a disruptive innovation? It gives you a different approach on how you do customer development. And maybe at the beginning, you're trying to figure out, you know, which one am I? But you ask different questions because you're giving uh, the customer different value props. Okay, so customer discovery for breakthrough innovation. We're going to start in that quadrant. The best way of thinking about this is Steve Blank's early adopter pyramid because you, you've got to have someone that has a problem. That's not good enough. They need to know they have a problem. Okay, that's not good enough. This is where it starts to get better, right? Absolutely. Have they been actively looking for it? And even better, have, do they have a crappy solution they're using now? If they've cobbled together some Frankensteinian version of what they want, Yes, I mean, give the example that you guys ran into, your favorite customer. Our favorite customer, we walked in, described, you know, here's what we have and what we can do. Um, they told us without blinking that they had been doing vulnerability scanning and that the, every quarter they scanned uh, across their, their whole network. And then the 200 people that were using various versions of software populated spreadsheets, emailed the spreadsheet to some poor soul who then had to stitch it all together. They had looked for a solution. They hadn't found one. They'd cobbled together their own really, really painful version. So they knew where they wanted to go. So the main thing I want to emphasize here is having a solution for people that have a problem isn't good enough when you're a startup because you don't have enough time and money for that pyramid to build up. You need to seek out people that are further up this pyramid so that you can get initial customers to be able to raise money against and fund your operation. So applying this pyramid into the breakthrough innovation quadrant, you know, you're looking for uh, people that want technology that has never existed before and your technology fits that. So then your, your job is to reach out and try to find you know, who, who has been longing for your solution. The example with the baby monitoring, Yes, yeah, so that, that company that had the magnetic waves that could detect a heartbeat, GrowthX uh, was thinking about investing in them, but they were almost out of money and they didn't have any actual customers. So after sitting down and brainstorming, we came up with, well, do baby monitoring manufacturing companies care about this? GrowthX emailed out to the eight top manufacturers, the CEO and the guy in charge of deals and said, 
you know, we solve this problem. Do you care enough to have a conversation about it? Not do you want to buy it from us, but do you care enough to take your precious time, Mr. CEO, and talk about it? Seven of them emailed us back within 48 hours. That company had a contract that paid them to finish building the product within four weeks. That's how ready these customers were for a solution. So that's the kind of reaction you need to get as a startup. Yeah, well, this, first of all, that customer development that GrowthX did was genius. I, I've seen a lot of startups that had breakthrough technology and s- stopped their customer development, the, the, the place where they got a lukewarm response. But for breakthrough, if it's truly breakthrough innovation, it's got to be, the customer development has got to be towards the people who are dying of thirst for it. Okay, so we're going to switch gears here. Now we're going to talk about customer discovery for disruptive innovation. So here you've got existing market, and you've got to figure out what's giving them enough heartburn to switch to your itty bitty startup. That's right. So remember, one of in the disruptive quadrant, one of the entry points is to carve out another part of the customer, like create a new customer segment. One way of doing that is finding commonality around dissatisfaction. So if you have a group of customers who are putting up with the current solution because that's really the only thing on the menu and you can find out what what they're looking for, now you can carve out that whole part of the, the, the segment. And so here, you know, one way of thinking about it is, is this disruptive enough that they'll switch and you've got customers that are already doing it but they hate the current solution. And you may not even be cheaper, like a car is more expensive than a horse. It's just taking a horse some places is really, it sucks and people don't want to do it. So they would switch. A horse would get you there, but it'd get you there slower. You don't have to shovel a car shit. You can, you can pick up more groceries with a car. I mean, so there's, there's enough people that hate, <laughs> hate picking up groceries on a horse, that they'll buy a car. So another thing is, is, it, is there a massive difference in cost? Because, you know, and a great example of this is SpaceX. They're reusing their rockets, which mm-hmm. lowers the cost of getting a kilogram into space from like a thousand. I think the last thing I read was $80. So it's over a 10x decrease in cost. Wow. Pe- people will switch for that. I mean, they just blasted off four astronauts to the uh, International Space mm-hmm. Station because it's just the best alternative. But so I want to talk about SpaceX. So before, I guess the there was a the ability to get things into space was its own thing, and that's great. But there was no way of really reusing. You can reuse it, the transport mechanism. And that's that was that's their big breakthrough. All right, another area you can explore is turning a cost center into a profit center, and and you guys had a lot of a, a luck with this one. Does this work for you? Absolutely, it did. Uh, when we partnered with quite a few outsourcing firms, their their problem was that they already they had to do the work, they had to do the scanning. It was it was bundled in and invisible as part of the offering to their customers. What we allowed them to do was to break it out as a line item, give visibility to to their customers, and upsell a premium service without incurring more more costs. They could actually charge for it. And Amazon has done an amazing job. They've gone through everything that's a cost to them and is just systematically turning it into something that they provide as a service and get paid for. Absolutely. So they are buying all kinds of solutions from vendors to turn their cost centers into profit centers. Now, a big important part of this is to understand who will not be your customer Existing players that are successful and already making money and have a lot of customers will absolutely hate you and never do business with you. That is true. That and, is true. You know, we ran into it with newspapers and offline dating companies. We, because of the way we sold it and at the price point we sold it, we destroyed their model and they talked about partnering or they talked about trying to copy us, but they couldn't and would never do a deal with us. What about you guys? We had the same thing where um, you know, we saw a natural partnership with the, the con- big five consulting firms where they a service of scanning. They couldn't afford to cannibalize their hourly charge in order to get to a scaling 
thing. So we offered scaling and a, a cheaper way of doing it. And they freaked out and said, we don't need a cheaper way of doing it. We build by the hour. And so if, from the business model, it was, it was antithetical to everything they believed in. So don't waste your time with these guys. You, you, you will, they will suck up time and resources and never turn into revenue. So the big takeaway from this book is it's an interesting intellectual framework with which to look at your startup and where you're going and make sure that you're not in that hellish sustaining innovation quadrant. Mm -hmm. And then focus on what kind of customer development do I need to do to sell either a breakthrough innovation or a disruptive innovation. This is really like having a compass in my pocket a way of looking at where am I and where do I need to go based on that. Absolutely. So hope you enjoyed this bootstrappers. If you have questions, ask them in the comments below. We'll get back to everyone. That's subscribe right. to that channel. Solution to hit the subscribe button. Uh, it actually also gives us a really big boost and we know that you like what we're offering. If you click on the little bell, you'll get notified every time we do a video. And we're trying to put out one to two videos a week, and we're very responsive and just want to make this a good resource for you guys. If there was something that didn't make any sense, again, put it in the comments. We will respond. Have a great day. Awesome.